Hello everybody, my name is Ray. Welcome to the Evangelical Dark Web. Today, we're going to be discussing Gavin Ortland and his theological liberalism, specifically as it relates to Noah's Ark and the Flood. He is theologically liberal, which should be a surprise to no one, and we're going to go over that uh, in a, just a minute. But he, this is a theologically liberal position. It arises out of modernism and the idea that it, during the modernist era, people wanted to deny the supernatural and they attacked all sorts of miracles in scripture, the virgin birth, the creation account, and Noah's Ark is just one of those. And, and we're in the post-modernist era where people want to attack the natural. That's why you get all these other things about gender and uh, sexuality. So all that's an attack on the natural, but this is a little bit modernist. It's an attack on the supernatural. And that's what Gavin Ortland is compromising on. It's yesterday's battles that he's wrong on, but these yesterday's battles are still important. And that's why we're going to be discussing it. But first I want to let you know, Evangelical Dark Web is a Christian news gathering and commentary ministry. You can support us over at evangelicaldarkweb.org slash join. That's linked in the description below. Uh, we have a Patreon-like system. You can support us there, but the least you can do is like this video, subscribe to the channel, to the podcast, if you are new. So, this is who Gavin Ortland is. He's supposedly, you know, a Christian YouTuber, although he's not as prominent, I believe, as, you know, John Harris on YouTube or Right Response Ministries on YouTube, so you'd love to see that. But nonetheless, he's an up-and-comer in Big Eva, a uh, big future ahead of him within the guild. This is a picture of the Tim Keller Center for Cultural Apologetics. As you can see, there's a lot of homosexuals and uh, side B theo theological proponents. You got Sam Alberry, uh, who's a promoter of side B theology. Josh Butler, who was kicked out, but he did promote side B theology on homosexuality. Uh, Rachel Gilson, hardcore liberal, Rebecca McLaughlin, another liberal, Christopher Watkin, another liberal, uh, Michael Keller is also liberal, that's Tim Keller's son. Tim Keller was a liberal, by the way. And Gavin Ortland is who we're going to be focusing on today, but he's in this organization because he's a liberal. You do not get into the Tim Keller Center for Cultural Apologetics by having orthodox theology. Because Tim Keller was a false teacher, the Gospel Coalition is an evil ministry, and these people correctly understood Keller's teachings, and that's why they are the way that they are. So Tim Keller, false teacher, these people are his disciples, uh, they're his fellows, and it, it's very clear why they're his fellows, because they correctly understood Keller's theological liberalism and apply it, and that's what Gavin... Ortland is doing in his recent video, which we're going to be looking at today. So uh, Gavin Ortland has a lot of points and arguments to make. This is going to be a longer video, but we are going to listen to him at 1.25 speed. Here we go. Three quick clarifications about what is this proposal of a local flood. Number one, local does not necessarily mean small. It just means it didn't cover the entire planet. So a lot of times people will say, you know, well, if it was local, why do you even need an ark? <laughs> why do you just move out of the way, you know? And uh, a lot of people think that the flood was large and sudden and calamitous, but they simply think it doesn't concern Greenland and Japan and the South Pole and so forth. Second clarification, local does not necessarily mean that it, the flood didn't wipe out all human beings outside the ark. Some people think that, others don't. This is before the dispersion of humanity in Genesis 11 at the Tower of Babel. So the flood story is roughly Genesis 6 through 8. Chapter 9 is relevant. It's talking about Noah as well. So we're here in kind of that first section, the primeval history of Genesis. And this is before humanity had been spread out uh, after the Tower of Babel. So lots to get into there, but I'm just pointing out you don't have to say a local flood means only one portion of humanity. So for an example of someone who believes in a local flood, but one that is still universal with respect to human civilization, check out the ministry Reasons to Believe, and uh, Hugh Ross has done a lot of work on the flood story. That organization does a lot of great ministry, a lot of great evangelism, great apologetics, and he's a very good proponent of that view. So I'll put a link to some things that he's done on this topic, uh, that, and I just encourage you to, to, to learn about that perspective. Third, local versus global is not a matter of the truth or historicity of the event. I just want to be really clear on this, because sometimes people misunderstand this. Um, I believe that I believe in a historical event that is truly being recorded in the Bible. It really happened. It's a trustworthy account we have in Genesis. That's not the issue here. 
The issue I'm addressing here is the extent of the water. Just that specific. That does relate to the trustworthiness of Genesis. It's just, you, you can't really read Genesis and think that this didn't impact the whole earth. It's plain in the text. If anything, the scope of Genesis kind of goes from the whole world to, you know, more local as it goes along. But it's clear in Genesis when we're talking about, you know, God, you know, wanting to wipe out all of humanity that a global flood would be necessary to that end. And it's easily understood as that. And he's trying to ret and he's going to attempt to retcon scripture as in, it doesn't really mean all of the earth. Specific issue. Was it local or global? And basically I just want to dive in and give two reasons why I think it may have been local. And even though I think the scientific evidence is overwhelmingly in favor of that and against a global flood, these aren't really scientific arguments. I'm going to make primarily biblical arguments that they make a broader appeal uh, because I'm not a scientist and I'll just keep it focused on the scripture. I think from the scripture alone, you can make a pretty good case. So here's my two arguments. Number one, the same language used in Genesis 6 through 8 that seems so universal is used for local regions all the time throughout the Bible. So the phrase, the whole earth, comes from the Hebrew word eretz, meaning land or country or earth or ground. Lots of different ways you can translate it. And then the word kol, meaning all or every. Eretz is used over 2,500 times in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's translated earth about one-fourth of the time. The phrase kol eretz, all the earth or all the land or all the country, is used about 207 times. And only in about 40 of those might it mean all of planet Earth. So in the majority of cases, by a pretty wide margin, coal arets often has, usually has a local referent. Now, sometimes you know that because of a qualifier. So for example, in the first two occurrences of this phrase in the Bible, Genesis 2, 11 and 13, you have the whole land of Havilah and the whole land of Cush. But even without the qualifier, this is the common meaning. So years ago, Rich Deem wrote an article that listed 56 examples of Kol Eretz having a local referent in the Hebrew Bible. I'll put up on the screen the first 10 in canonical order, uh, and then on this screen, and then I'll put the next five on the next screen. You can pause and read through these if you want. Already you can tell, like, you know, a, a a translation like in the land is gives you a very different kind of flavor of meaning than on the earth. But just to give me the land. I'm, I'm going back for a second. So if you look at the way that these are, the context of these uses of that Hebrew, they're tied to a geography. Genesis 6 is not tied to a specific geography. And that's a major problem with his argument here. That's why it's plainly read as the whole earth, because there is no geologic or geographical reference point to localize the event. These, if you want, already you can tell, like, you know, a, a translation like in the land is gives you a very different kind of flavor of meaning than on the earth. But just to give maybe two examples to dive in, Genesis 41, 57 says, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. Now, we don't have to conclude that people from Northern Siberia traveled down to the Middle East and the ancient Mayans beat Christopher Columbus to the punch in sailing across the Atlantic Ocean and Aboriginal Australians made their way across India or the Indian Ocean to make it to the Middle East. I'm not. I'm going to give lots of specific examples throughout this video. In no way am I trying to poke fun at an alternative view. I'm just trying to be specific with what this would mean. So when it says all the earth is afflicted by this famine and they come to Egypt, no one really interprets it, meaning literally like all of planet earth. And this is pretty recurrent all throughout the Hebrew Bible. First Kings 10. Because it's geographically qualified with beginning in Egypt. There's a center point. There's a r focal point. Uh, so that's, that would be why. 24, when the whole earth comes to Solomon to hear his wisdom, we, we're not required to think that people came from Canada and Brazil and East Asia and so forth to learn from Solomon. And that's true for that, the phrase kol eretz, all the earth, but also the other phrases in Genesis 6 through 8 that might seem universal initially. But then you see all throughout the Hebrew Bible, they're used for a local referent, like the phrase under the whole heaven in Deuteronomy 2.25 doesn't mean that people like Native Americans in the United States at that time are afraid of Moses. Uh, when Elijah is told in 1 Kings 18 that there's no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you, we're not required to think of Ahab's spies going up into Scandinavia, various islands in the world where there's human civilization and so forth. So basically what I'm trying to do so far is just appeal to context, in this case, the, the rest of the Hebrew Bible, to show this kinds of kind of language has a lot of precedent for having a local 
reference. Now, then we can just ask, you know, why would that be? Why would they talk like this? And here we just have to try to submit ourselves to what the scripture is trying to communicate rather than immediately make us say, ah. This is the same thing as trying to make the day age argument in Genesis 1. The problem is the rest of scripture interprets that scripture as being individual days. They're literal days. They're not day ages. So the rest of scripture believes that Genesis 1 refers to days. And what does the rest of scripture say about the flood? It clearly implicates that the flood was global. There's no way to read the Bible and say that this was a local event. That's not a natural reading of the text. That's why you don't see it emerge until modernism. Now, he's going to try to argue against that, but we're going to wait until he makes that argument to debunk it. If I could just make an appeal for humility in how we read the Bible, we're reading an English translation with a modern understanding of planet Earth as a round globe orbiting the sun between Venus and Mars. So when we hear certain language, you know, we're going to bring a lot to the table in terms of how we interpret that language. The biblical writers and the original readers were not aware of the South Pole or Alaska or New Zealand, so they would have absolutely no reason to use language that would reflect entities that they didn't know existed. They were just using the ordinary language of the time to refer to the known world. And that's completely natural for people back then to speak like that. When we say all the earth, we just mean all the earth we've ever known, you know? And so our task in reading the scripture is to submit to what the original author meant and how the original hearers received the text. That is where meaning is furnished. And actually it's, so one way we respect the scripture is we submit to what it intends to say rather than kind of immediately uh, draw it into our horizon of concerns and all our modern questions, many of which the Bible actually isn't addressing directly. Even in the New Testament, you'll find comprehensive language to refer to the known world, the Mediterranean world. Colossians 1.6, the gospel bearing fruit in the whole world. Well, we know that, you know, the American continents hadn't been evangelized yet. Acts 2.5 says there were dwelling in Jerusalem uh, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and then the nations are listed. And it doesn't include places like Brazil and Japan and so forth. Now, one factor that supports this way of thinking in Genesis 6 through 8, that we're not thinking globally so much as the known world is Genesis 10, which comes right after. And the, uh, the so-called table of nations, this is listing all of the different nations that are descended from Noah and his sons. And they're all local. They're talking primarily about the Middle East. So this is a major... You know, this is where he's basically opening up the door to say that not all of humanity is wiped out by the flood, which is textbook theological liberalism, by the way. And I I think the table of nations completely debunks that notion that not all the not all of humanity was wiped out. And if not all of human if all of humanity was wiped out, then the flood would have had to have been global. I think it's completely conceivable that the earth would have been more populated underneath or pre flood than pre bat or between the flood and Babel because there was sort of a renewed understanding of God and therefore a renewed understanding of how to rebel against God, if that makes sense. Uh, because, you know, this is a few generations from Ham and uh, Shem and Japheth that, you know, these people who try to make the Tower of Babel really rise up. So before uh, the flood, it, it's conceivable that much of the world was populated and that the population was great because you got to think about the lifespan and the birth rate and how many years passed. There was probably a lot of people that died uh, in Noah's day. And we don't know how... We don't know how widespread they were, but I kind of doubt that they were all hyper fixated in a local floodable region. That just doesn't seem very uh, natural. That's not the most natural reading of the text. So, but the table of nations does show the common ancestry of mankind. These nations become more nations. I, I am very fascinated with much of this uh, Genesis one through 11, because this is like large portions of human history that is lost. And it, it fascinates me as someone who's interested in history, but yes, this, the table of nations actually points to the fact that 
that the flood was global. You know, extending outward a bit into Asia and Africa and Europe, but we're not talking about Australia and Mexico and Northern Europe and so forth. And that provides more support for thinking that the, the sphere of awareness of the biblical authors was more limited. They were just using the ordinary language of the day to describe the world that they knew. Here's how Michael Heiser uh, helpfully explains this point about Genesis 10. What's the context of the nations in Genesis 1 through 11? What's the context of the world? And the answer is Genesis 10 the table of nations. We have 70 nations there. They're all Eastern Mediterranean, again, from the South, like in Africa, all the way up, you know, to, the, to what we would call the Caucasus now. And so some people will argue that is the context for the flood. That is the landmass that was affected by the flood. That is a region. It is not an entire globe. And so this view says it makes sense then, since the people who lived in Canaan, from, which these, from whence these giant clans came, where'd they live? They lived in these places described in Genesis 10. Okay, the Amorites, the Hittites from Anatolia, the Hurrians also from Anatolia. Again, you have Mesopotamia. You have the Aegean, the Sea Peoples. They're all in this region. And so their idea is, again, if you take option number two, is like, look, there was a flood here, and we've got the Nephilim issue. I mean, the Greeks know about this with the Titan story. The, the Hittites write about this. The Mesopotamians write about this with the Apkalu. Okay, they all know about th that there was a great flood. And this flood was a regional, local event, and not every person and not every one of these guys was killed. You had some survive and they become the progenitors of the Nephilim later that we get during the days of Moses and Joshua. So one of the issues there that he's addressing is this possibility of the Nephilim surviving. I'd love to do another video on who are the Nephilim. That's a fascinating question. A lot of people are interested in that. Um, but the point for now is just that these people or figures, whoever they are, are listed in, in Genesis 6 right before the flood. And then they seem to come up later in Numbers 13 when the Hebrew spies bring this report. Now, unless this language is referring to people who aren't biologically related to the Nephilim of Genesis 6, which is possible, but seems less likely, then a lot of people would see in this further support that the flood wasn't absolutely universal. I, I don't put a lot of weight on that myself. I'm kind of uncertain about the Nephilim issue, but I mention it in case it's of interest to others. What I think is pretty decisive is the local sphere of reference and awareness reflected in Genesis 10. And again here, the driving goal is simply what is the meaning of the text? What is the text trying to do? It sets the agenda. How, how the text uses language should be our concern. We have to adjust to it rather than drag it into our concerns. And sometimes we bring a lot onto the text. We have to remember this is an ancient document. So it's it it used language that reflected, you know, the fact that the scripture is is as as not every one of my viewers believes this, but as as a follower of Christ, I believe the scripture is the word of God. I, I really believe it is God's communication down to the little details. And I have a high view of scripture because I think Christ himself did. But a high view of scripture doesn't mean that the Bible doesn't use ordinary language. It's not like people are going to speak really technically and formally just because God is speaking through them. Actually, the Bible uses a lot of ordinary idiom. And I think the Bible's doing that here in Genesis 6 through 8. A final consideration for that is that within the text of Genesis 6 through 9, there are times where it's awkward to take Kol Eretz as all of planet Earth. And so to make this point, I thought the, the this video from the YouTube channel Inspiring Philosophy made the... So he's going to play a clip from Inspiring Philosophy, another liberal YouTuber that operates in Christianity. So it just keeps adding up. This point better than I could, so I'll show his little clip here. Then he sent forth a dove from him to see if the waters had subsided from the face of the ground. But the dove found no place to set her foot, and she returned to him to the ark, for the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. Well, wait a minute, I thought verse 5 said the tops of the mountains were seen. But in verse 9, it says the waters were still on the face of the whole earth. Uh, it's not really a contradiction, but what inspiring philosophy is about to do here is say that it's a contradiction for it not to be a local event, which... Again, I don't think that's a natural reading of the text. It, you could see, what if you can see the tops of the mountains through the water? And, you know, maybe you're trying to steer the boat. It's not exactly a natural reading of the text. And there's no limiting factors to where the localism would be for what area is affected by the flood. So, we're not... Well, this here. literally means the whole planet. The passage contains a contradiction. No. But if it was just a regional flood, and verse 9 is talking about how the waters had not receded from the region, which was the entirety of the flood, the passage makes more sense. The waters had not receded from the whole land, which was originally flooded, but the mountains in the distance were still seen. This also makes sense with something that is said after this, where it says, the waters were dried off the earth. Okay, this obviously doesn't refer to the whole earth, because we still have massive oceans. But it would make sense if it refers to the regional area, and that the waters receded from that region, not the whole earth.
So the point is simply that interpreting Kol Eretz consistently, meaning all the planets, you know, everywhere there's nothing but water that you can see, leads to some difficulties in reading the text. It seems better to allow this language to be more flexible and less exacting and more having reference to human perception and the ordinary way that we even tend to talk today sometimes. Now, let me address an objection at this point, and that's someone might say, if that's really a natural way to read the text, why did no one read it that way prior to the modern era? Uh, doesn't that... He's about to make his most compelling argument right here. ...show that this reading is just a concession to modern science. And in response to that, I would say two things. First, I would say... I understand why some Christians are very skeptical of things advanced in the name of science, because sometimes science can be weaponized. But I also think it's wrong to adopt a totally skeptical posture towards science. I think that's unhelpful. I think we should seek to harmonize general and special revelation. And that means there's no way around the hard task of trying to distinguish between good scientific claims and bad scientific claims. And I don't think it's helpful to have a posture of just total skepticism toward that task. Now, I've gone into that a little bit more in my response to Ken Ham, the second video responding to him on creation. So I won't really dwell on that point here. I'll just make a more basic point. There do seem to be pre-modern exegetes who interpret the flood as local. It's less common, but you can find that. A lot of times they're just not thinking in our same categories today in the pre-modern era. But one example would be Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, probably the foremost ancient Jewish historian. And he is not known for having wild and fanciful interpretations of the Hebrew Bible. He's often quite literal and conservative in his reading of the Hebrew Bible. But he references the others who are afraid to come down from the mountains after the flood and who then follow the example of Noah's sons in repopulating the plains. So Noah's sons are the first ones who have come down and then they follow their example. It sounds like he's just assuming there were other survivors. And that's how this passage in Josephus is often taken. Uh, the translator, Louis Feldman, who's probably the world's leading scholar in Josephus studies, takes it that way. I'll put up his statement. Dude's wearing a yarmulke, by the way, which I think is a relevant detail, but about this as well. So the point is, there do seem to be, it, it, it's not just a modern innovation. Like so many of these things, and I made the same point with Augustine on other matters of Genesis. Actually, it's true. You know, I, this is really true, and I would just encourage people to not disbelieve me until you've looked into it for yourself. Ancient readers of Scripture were not as literalistic as modern-day fundamentalists. There was more flexibility, and we need to consider that. Okay. So this is his most compelling argument is using Josephus to argue for a local flood event. The problem with his argument is it's a lie. And he's relying on some Jewish scholar who has a very obscure reading of um, book one, chapter four, section one. So that is a very obscure way to read the text. And to me, it doesn't make sense. So he is reading others to mean as though there's people that w survived the flood. That's how that scholar is reading it. But the only people that are referenced in that section are the direct descendants of Seth and Noah and his three sons. So those are the only people referenced in that entire chapter. There is no other group of people if that is you know, if those others was referring to people not descended from noah those same others are not referenced in the rest of that chapter discussing this portion of history that is a very bad reading of the text that seems to be a novel reading of the text by that scholar and it just because it's a lie that's not what Josephus believed about the flood because they're quoting the section after the flood during the flood Josephus very much seems to have the normal biblical narrative that this was a global flood that God wanted to destroy all of humanity uh, for their unrighteousness he says something along the lines that Noah had a longer lifespan on account of his righteousness so he does make some theological arguments, but none of them go against the idea of a global flood. It is a lie that to say that Josephus argued for a local flood. That, that's just not in Josephus's uh, text at all. And you can go look at it. It's the Antiquities of the Jews, Book 1, Chapter 3 and 4 are your relevant pieces. Very easy to fact check this. And Gavin Ortland did not fact check this. Second argument. Envisioning a global flood requires multiplying miracles that are not mentioned in the text. 
Now, I want to be very clear here that this is not a matter of God's omnipotence. God can do anything. God can totally make a global flood. God can make a flood the size of our solar system. <laughs> if he wanted to, he can create all the water he wants. He's omnipotent. I'm perfectly happy to believe in miracles when the Bible records them. And obviously in the flood story, there's a lot of miracles. When B.B. Warfield was once asked, what is Christianity? His simple reply was unembarrassed supernaturalism. I like that. And I'm not embarrassed about miracles. I think it's rational to believe that miracles can occur. The question is, what are the miracles that are actually in the text? And I think, in general, an interpretation of Scripture is weakened when it requires you to start positing more and more miracles that aren't recorded in the text, in many cases are not implied by the text, and especially so if some of these miracles are pretty fantastic, pretty ad hoc. Okay, another way to state this concern is to say, often an appeal will be made for a, a global flood on the basis of a natural reading. We're told this is just the natural way to read the text. And I can sympathize truly with, with people who feel that way. But again, sometimes things get more complicated with time the more you think about it. I've been thinking about this for 25 years now, and it does get more complicated the more you stare at it. This appeal to a natural reading starts to become less natural when you start to actually conceptualize all that it entails and all the miracles that need to be inserted into the story that actually aren't in the text. Let me give five examples. And in saying these, I'm not trying to be insulting or to make fun of anything. I'm just trying to draw out what a global flood really involves. We need to understand what we're asking of people if we insist this is the only way to have a high view of Scripture. Five examples. Number one is the transportation of animals to the ark and then back afterwards from all around the globe. Genesis 6.20 says that two of every sort of animal shall come into you, but it says nothing about a kind of miraculous transportation from their original location, nor back to it when the flood is over. It just basically says that the flood subsides and they got off the ark. Now, uh, this is going to be miraculous any way you slice it, but the miracles are in a different register when you think about a global flood. So just picture, you know, Arctic wolves in northern Canada, kangaroos and wallabies and marsupials in Australia, the various species of indigenous animals to Madagascar, a little island off the coast of Southeast Africa, poison dart frogs in the rainforests of Brazil, uh, giant salamanders in the freshwater pools of Japan, llamas in the Andes Mountains of Peru and Bolivia, penguins in the South Pole, giant tortoises in the Galapagos Islands. I try to think of like some of my favorite animals. I love animals. We live in St. Louis for two years. They have a great free zoo. We'd go to the zoo all the time. I find animals fascinating. And so, you know, so I'd like to get specific with this, not trying to poke fun at this, but trying to put it out there as a legitimate curiosity to ask, how did this happen? How did they get all get to the ark? How did they all return to their respective territories? How did they cross oceans to get there in some cases? How did they survive being so out of their ordinary environment? Um, if it was a natural process of migration, why do we have no fossil records whatsoever of that? You know, all the kangaroos. We don't have fossil records of evolution. What are you talking about fossil records for? Like, you're the theological liberal. You really don't want to be going to the fossil records, to, you know, part of the debate. So what this really boils down to is that he wants to shrink the miracle of God. Uh, he wants to reduce the amount of glory that God gets from flooding and destroying the earth, which I don't think is a good way to interpret scripture. Like what gives God the most glory to me is a better way to interpret scripture and even have a theology to some degree uh, than, you know, did God really do this? So the idea of how do the animals get there? Well, it's obviously a supernatural event how Noah got all these animals together. That's obviously supernatural. But how did they leave? Like, really? Same answer as how they got there in the first place. This isn't that hard. Roof fossils are only on in Australia. All the ring-tailed lemur fossils are only in Madagascar, etc. Now, there's explanations for this. You can go and read the Young Earth Creationist websites and books and find various explanations. And I'm not trying to deride them, but I'm trying to say those explanations are not in the text. You have to add a bunch of miracles that don't, they're, they're not in the text and they don't even seem to be implied by the text, uh, especially in the case of their return after the flood is over. So for that interpretation to work, you've got to add all these extra miracles. Second example, the quantity of animals on the ark. The Bible tells us how big the ark is. By the way, it's probably not as big as the ark in Kentucky associated with Answers in Genesis. Some of you may have visited that ark before. I've never been, um, but they use a disputed uh, interpretation of the word cubit. Typically, that's taken to be around 18 inches. Even the classic Young Earth Creationist text, the Genesis Flood, defines a cubit as 17.5 inches. But uh, to build the Ark in Kentucky, they defined it as a little more than 20 inches, if I understand correctly. So that makes it 510 feet long. It's probably a little less than that. But that's not 100% certain. People dispute the meaning of cubit. So let's give them that extra space. Fine. It's still... 
Yeah, the, the problem with using ancient measurements is that they change depending on the time period. Even within the Bible, like a cubit might be a different length at different portions of the time in the scripture uh, because it's, you know, kind of like a foot. Are we talking a Roman foot, an imperial foot, a Roman mile? It, it all varies on what time period you're in. So that's why it's a disputed figure. Well, a lot to fit all the animals of the world into the ark. And so uh, the way this breaks down is people have to talk through, how do you define the biblical word kind? Older young earth creationists will talk, you know, it'll be like 30,000 an total animals, something like that, including all the pairs. Uh, more recently though, they bring the number way down. So Answers in Genesis and some other young earth creationist ministries will have just a couple thousand animals sometime. And the way they're able to do that is by defining the word kind very broadly. So one article at Answers in Genesis uses the word kind as similar to the word family in our modern taxonomy of animals. So that's an even broad, the word family in, in modern classification of animals is even broader than the term species. Uh, sorry, e even broad, well, certainly broader than species, even broader than the word genus. Uh, I'll, I'll put this up. You can see in the yellow uh, uh, on the picture I'm putting up. This would mean there's like one dog animal or one cat animal. So basically what this results in is extremely rapid evolution after the flood, lightning speed evolution. A little more than 4,000 years ago, you have just two animals of the cat kind and then today you have the dozens of species and all the different genuses that descend from just those two animals, lions and tigers and cheetahs and jaguars and panthers and leopards and lynxes and bobcats and pumas and wildcats and all the way down to domestic cats. They all come in less than 5,000 years from two animals uh, on the ark. Same with the horse family or kind. You get zebras and donkeys and all the different kinds of horses from those two animals in less than 5,000 years. In the dog kind or family, you get all the different dog species. Uh, Again, dogs are probably the worst example you could use to make your to try to debunk this notion considering how much we have bred dogs rapidly here on earth like uh, mankind can make a new do breed of dog yet at the same time we can't make a new species of dog which kind of debunks the whole macro evolution argument but if you look at these a lot of these animals can intermate still Dogs and wolves, I believe, can intermate. And foxes as well. And then you have like these different uh, feral breeds where they're kind of mixed and they roam around and they're mixed between d wolves and coyotes. So these animals can still kind of interbreed to some capacity. So it's not a good example for them to use. Uh, the equine family... Not, again, not a very good uh, example to use. Now, here's the thing. Were there 5,800 5, species of lizards at Noah's flood time? I kind of doubt it. So, obviously, there had to have been some expansion of you know, the species and the taxonomy of animals. Especially when they recongregated in different places. The idea that evolution, you know, is so gradual and slow, according to Darwin, is just kind of ridiculous. Because these little micro changes don't offer a significant advantage to survival. Thus is why evolution is a kind of a flawed premise on its on its surface. But the idea that, hey, animals when isolated can rapidly breed and genetic develop differences, just like people can. A lot more logical. Uh, wolves, coyotes, foxes, jackals, etc. Also, you know, because at the same time, human phenotypes also get very diverse from eight people on the boat. So the differences between a lot of these different types of animals is also seen in humans as well, and the features that they would end up getting. You know, in incredible lightning speed evolution. And it's kind of ironic that the people who believe in the most powerful form of evolution are often the young earth creationists because they have to squeeze it into this tiny time frame. And even though sometimes they won't use the word evolution, you know, here's another quote I'll put up from an Answers in Genesis article. It's not using the word evolution, but it's the same mechanisms, genetic drift, natural selection, mutation, etc. Now, I'm not trying to pick on Answers in Genesis here uh, or isolate them. Sometimes I'll, nor, nor am I trying to say this is the only way you could work as a, as a young earth creationist. It's one representative example. 
sometimes when I quote from a young earth creationist source, people will get angry and say, I'm not quoting from the best of the movement. I don't always know what the best is. And I think it's fair game to quote from what's commonly known and what's influential and what's out there. But if you don't have lightning speed evolution, then you have to have more species on the ark. And so there's a trade-off here one way or another, either more animals or more evolution. However you negotiate that trade-off, it's really hard to imagine all land dwelling vertebrate animals getting onto the ark, especially, so you have to get more miracles one way or another that, that aren't in the text. That's especially true because of what I think is probably the most underrated difficulty, and that's number three example that I'm going to give, and that's the care for these animals while they're on the ark. So if you've ever worked at a zoo, you know how much goes into caring for animals, how easy disease can be and so forth, even if you just had a pet. <laughs> We're thinking about getting a dog, and so we're thinking about all this. Okay, in this case, you have all the animals of the entire world, at least in their kind, and you have eight people caring for them for more than a year in extremely taxing conditions. So you got the seven days of loading up and then about 370 days when they're on the ark, if you add up all the different events together. And there's only eight people, Noah, his wife, his three sons, their wives, and they have to provide uh, ventilation, sanitation, proper temperatures, fresh food, and fresh water for all of these animals, all the animals of the world for over a year. If you think that through, <laughs> let's not get too graphic, you know, um, but you think through all that that is involved, uh, with so it's just just thinking of the food and water you have to supply i mean some of these animals are special climate animals like polar bears and they have to live alongside animals that are used to the desert some of them are special diet animals like koala bears which eat eucalyptus tree leaves which are only grown in australia uh one of the big challenges which don't provide a whole lot of nutritional value for the koala by the way like come on koalas are kind of like pandas they don't eat well they don't eat right in the wild <laughs> Challenges is for insects and tidal pool creatures and other small invertebrate animals. You'd almost need something like what are the equivalent of modern day aquariums for taking some care of many of these smaller animals. Now, whether insects are on the ark is a disputed question. A lot of people, young earth creationists, will say, well, some insects may have been in that kind of thing. One, but you know, there's different explanations. The point is, whatever explanation you go with, you've got to go way beyond the text to try to make it work. Um, for example, one theory that comes from Bede in the early church or late patristic, early medieval church, and is picked up in the book, The Genesis Flood, is that all the animals hibernated. So you can see this theory as it's put up. This book, The Genesis Flood, is one that's often credited with launching the modern young earth creationist movement as such. It has this proposal that God instructed certain of the animals through impartation of a migratory directional instinct, which would afterward be inherited in greater or lesser degree by their descendants to flee from their native habitats to the place of safety. Then, having entered the ark, they also received from God the power to become more or less dormant in various ways in order to be able to survive for the year in which they were to be confined within the ark while the great storms and Convuls, convulsions raged outside so now god can do that god is omnipotent that's an interesting theory and at the end of the day the idea of trying to localize the flood doesn't get rid of these problems it just shrinks them he's talking about multiplying miracles that is the point that he's trying to make but at the end of the day he's just trying to shrink the miracle because all of these are issues regardless because he has five things coming up all of these are issues, regardless of whether you're local or global. He's just shrinking the miracle. He's he's trying to, you know, talk about multiplying. And I guess, you know, in terms of magnitude, yeah, you need something more than just simple addition. But he's shrinking it. My point that I'm trying to raise here is that that goes beyond the text. Uh, a, a global migratory instinct, universal hibernation, you know, all of this requires us to start stacking up more and more miracles. And if you don't have those miracles, you need some other kind of miracle to explain how do eight people for more than a year care for all the animals of the entire world. And what I'm trying to help us see is not I'm not trying to make fun of this view or make someone feel like they're being uh, mocked or something like that. It's not my intention. What I'm trying to help us feel is to reduce the sense that this is the only way you can read this text and that this is the natural reading. Because if you start thinking it through, it seems a little less natural the more you think about it. Example four, which I get from David Snoke's helpful book that addresses this, is where did all this water come from? To cover the Himalayan mountains and all the mountains of the world, the Andes Mountains, the Rocky Mountains, you'd need water that would go about six miles above sea level. We just don't have that. That, that quantity of water simply does not exist. So you'd either have a miraculous creation and destruction of additional water, or you'd have the extremely rapid formation of mountains in connection with the flood or soon thereafter, so that Mount Everest is just a few thousand years old. So this would mean this kind of global 
cataclysmic reshaping of geology uh, to create these deep basins in the ocean, to drain the water into, and to shoot up these mountains super fast and fast, basically immediately. Now, that's possible, but again, it's just going beyond the text. All the text credits for ending the flood is a wind that God sends to make the waters subside. A uh, fifth example would be, what, how do plants and trees survive? What about water animals? You know, if you mix, I've, I read a lot of the different theories about how the fish and water animals can survive when you mix fresh water and salt water, and there's all kinds of interesting theories about that. Another question you have to explain is how do trees and plants and, and then insects come in with this as well? How do they all survive? One of the theories that's referenced in the Genesis flood book is the idea of floating vegetation rafts. And some people say that um, the I insects could have been on those. So, you know, again, I'm not trying to say that's the only proposal, but that's one idea. If you don't have those kinds of explanations, you need something else. One way or another, you've got to supply all these additional miracles to make sense of the text. So I hope, I, I hope I'm articulating my concern there in a way that's respectful, but also gets across how difficult this is and why a lot of us would say if the language is can be permissibly and responsibly used for a local reference, that seems like it makes a lot more sense. Okay. Now, to be clear, if it's a local flood, it's still miraculous. The transportation of the it's animals, the sending of water, miracle. God's communication with Noah, all of that requires God's meticulous involvement, his intervention, and so forth. But the point is that the kinds of miracles associated with a local flood seem to fit better with the transportation of the animals, the size of the ark, the number of people involved, the amount of time involved, etc. At the very least, allowing for a local flood should not be written off as a liberalism or as just not taking the Bible seriously, as so often happens. For me personally, you know, I, just to speak personally, I'm, I'm not just a total... It is liberalism, because liberalism is the only reason that you would have come to this reading. He, you know, made up something about Josephus, and then didn't provide any other examples from antiquity or the patristics that would lead to a conclusion. You can find, you know... Augustine, who had an, an unorthodox view of Genesis 1, he had an unorthodox view on that. It's just point blank. It wasn't orthodox because he just directly contradicts scripture and in his interpretation of it. You can find that. You don't find that on Genesis 6. The biggest debate, you know, going back that far was the Nephilim. That's the biggest debate. And I'm not an, an expert on that. I know Calvin held to the line of Seth, line of uh, the line of Seth view of the sons of God and the sons of man. And most other people hold to giants and stuff like that. So there's that debate, but his debate or his point really changes the trajectory of human history from the flood. You know, you're looking at the table of nations. It's basically arguing against that and making exceptions to that. Because there's all these other nations, you know, aboriginals in Australia or the Native Americans. We get, we need to have an explanation for them that is outside of the table of nations. And it kind of leads to stuff like that, which I think only comes from liberalism. So mankind has a common ancestry and it goes back to Noah. That's what the Bible says. And to really try to undermine this belief in, by trying to localize a flood, which is just as, I, I would say it's very illogical. So con consider this meme. So this is a meme of basically there's a, a wall, there's an edge of a table that's water, and then the ark could just sail off of it. Because it's a local flood. So the again, the problem with Gavin Ortland's view is there's no limiting factors naturally to the local localized flood. If it's a global flood, there doesn't need to be specific geographical limiting factors to the flood. But with him, he does need that. His argument needs that theology nerd who's in who's uh i mean i love theology but i think about these things at a pastoral and personal level i've been through my my time of working through how do i think this through i know a lot of others have as well for me personally adhering to a local flood as what i think is much more likely is my best effort to submit to the text and what i think it's intending to convey in its own context reading the bible responsibly and well as an ancient document that is true but using ancient language and an ancient sphere of reference okay Final section of it's the just video. That none of the Let me conclude agree. by making a case that I think we can believe in the flood story as a credible and true historical event. Uh, 
because the other, you know, I feel multiple pressures when I make a video like this. From one side, it's from, I know some Christians will say I'm compromising. But the other pressure, and I, I don't think I am, but I'm trying to respectfully interact with that and push back. The other pressure I feel is from skeptics or uh, others outside the Christian faith or even some who are... Like, uh, like I said in the beginning of the video, he's a Tim Keller acolyte. He is literally a Tim Keller Center fellow. So he's trying to third way this issue. You know, there's these, the fundamentalists, I don't want to be like them, but I'm not an atheist either. So third way, I got to come up with the third way. That's the biblical way. It's always this nebulous third way. Uh, and that, that is straight from Tim Keller. Christians who might feel like they might feel like Bill Maher. Like this story is crazy. Like why would anybody take this story seriously? Okay. Again, you're, you're using Bill Maher. Like he, people commonly listen to him that aren't, you know, old white dudes who have HBO and listen to Bill Maher. Like, come on, people don't listen to Bill Maher. So let me address that concern. Something that is interesting is how many extra biblical ancient texts also have reference to a flood story, some of them in remarkably similar ways to the story of Genesis 6 through 8. One of them is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, another is the Epic of Atrahasis, Atrahasis, I think you pronounce it. Uh, and the similarities between these stories and the biblical story get down to their details. They're very interesting. You know, uh, there's really important theological differences, but some of, this, some of the details are quite amazing that, you know, the role of uh, a dove and a raven afterwards in finding the land, for example, finding the dry ground. Um, although some of the Babylonian accounts include a swallow as well. But so I'm not trying to overpress the similarities, but there's enough similarities that you say, this is fascinating. How do you explain that? And one good view is that there's, it's not a question of borrowing one from the other, but that they have a collective shared memory. So people call them cognates, which means basically they, they're, neither one is borrowing from the other. They're just a part of the shared memory of this ancient event. And then beyond these specific similarities, you find many other legends all throughout the ancient world that are recalling this massive cataclysmic flood event. Ken Keithley and Mark Rooker argue that there are 68 distinct such stories uh, extending to all places all around the world. And they say no comparable event in biblical history has the same extra biblical attestation as the flood in the history of religion and world history. Now, the appeal here would be basically to say, even if you think this story is just a myth in the Bible or is just a crazy story with no historical backing behind it, then you have to find some kind of explanation for where all these legends came from. And there's actually good reasons to believe there's some kind of huge catastrophic event in ancient history that lived on in the memory of various cultures and inspired these various stories. The only question then would be the relation between the historical event and these various stories. So let me give one example. So, again, the problem that he's going to run into is it looks like all these other accounts interpreted as a global event. That's why it's in their collective memory, because it's that daunting. Two scientists wrote a, a fascinating book arguing that there was a vast flood around the year 5600 BC that resulted in what we today call the Black Sea. Now, this is not a Christian book. These are just two scientists. The book's description says, using sound waves and coring devices to probe the sea floor, William Ryan and Walter Pittman revealed clear evidence that this inland body of water had once been a vast freshwater lake lying hundreds of feet below the level of the world's rising oceans. Sophisticated dating techniques confirmed that 7,600 years ago, the mounting seas had burst through the narrow Bosphorus Valley and the salt water of the Mediterranean had poured into the lake with unimaginable force racing over beaches and up rivers, destroying or chasing all life before it. Commenting on this book, Tremper Longman and John Walton comment, Ryan and Pittman's thesis is intriguing. Before they encountered this evidence, they doubted that the biblical flood story had any reference to a real historical event. Rather, it was pure myth. Now they believe a real event stands behind the flood story. It's interesting because the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov have some of the most shallowest ocean water on the earth. Now, I'm not trying to say that that exact proposal... 5,600 BC and the Black Sea is the correct one. I'm an agnostic on the details. I don't know exactly how big and where and and when this event occurred uh, in, in, in the details. Uh, a lot of people have argued for a larger territory that would include the Black Sea, but also the Arabian Sea, the Red Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Caspian Sea, basically this huge chunk of the Middle East. And I'm not sure about that. I don't have a position. But my point is, there's actually good reasons for believing there was some kind of calamitous flood event that shaped ancient humanity profoundly and left its memory upon these various different cultures. And as long as we're not we're careful not to overstate what the Bible requires people to believe, this story need not be a liability. It's actually pretty compelling, especially when you read the Bible at, in line with its intended meaning and not kind of mold it into modern science in, in an overly literalistic way. At the very least, allowing for a local flood theory to be a Christian option is helpful for us right now, I think. 
uh, those of the Christians who are persuaded of that view should still be welcomed as members of our churches. Um, those investigating the Christian faith should not be required to take one option or the other just to be a Christian. That's my deepest concern. I think when we present the gospel to people, my deepest hope for my YouTube channel, as much as I'm diving into kind of some somewhat nerdy stuff here, I realize, uh, my deepest hope for my YouTube channel is that it will help people encounter Jesus himself. And his claims are already challenging and offensive enough. We don't want to put any additional burdens on people as they're... <laughs> this is just dumb because the claims of Jesus rely on the authenticity the accuracy and the inerrancy of scripture like all of jesus depends on the scripture being what god says that scripture is and that includes the flood narrative that includes the creation account that includes the parting of the red sea and the virgin birth all these other mir like some people try to say that it's just the resurrection that's all we need for christianity to be true but jesus died was buried rose again according to the scriptures the bible tells us that that it was according to the scriptures that jesus rose from the dead so christianity is dependent on the bible because the bible is god's word and jesus is the word made flesh so the idea that we don't want to place any other burdens on you know people who are skeptical of the bible because then they might run away. Well, you know, we look at the parable of Lazarus and the, the, the rich man, the idea that the rich man and his brothers, they don't believe, you know, God sent them the prophet and the law. and They didn't believe that. Why would they believe a man who rose from the dead? So that's how we got to think about this. If you don't believe the Bible, why would you have believed in Jesus if you saw him rise from the dead? And, and that's kind of the lesson from that story. So that it does appear to be the end of this long uh, video from Gavin Ortland. First time discussing him and maybe there'll be more to come. But again, theological liberals doing theologically liberal things. Be again, he is a Tim Keller fellow for a reason. It's not an accident that he's part of he's in an elite club of other liberal up and comers in Big Eva. It's not an accident. So that's all I got to say about that for now. My name is Ray. This is the Evangelical Dark Web. If you like this content, subscribe. If you are new, have a blessed day. We will catch you on the next one.